Let's call the meeting to order. We're all present this evening. <coughs> item two, at the commissioner's request, discuss any item of concern on the regular session agenda of April the 16th, 2019. Your last chance. I have no concerns. <laughs> on the regular too, too late agenda? for concerns. Pardon me? On the regular agenda? Did I not say that? Yeah, so the my... regular session agenda. Well, um, one, I had one thing that got brought up to me today is that the, I guess we're voting on the VDA yeah. board. Yes. The people that were applicants for that just found out today that they were supposed to be at the meeting tonight. <laughs> And I don't think that that is a very fair or just way to do that. If, if we want to table it, uh, I, I'm going to make a motion. I got something to that I haven't had a chance to respond yeah. to yet, but I'm fine. We can table that and bring it back next time. Because I think they should have more notice than that. We, we typically try to do that. and if This is the second time in a row that he said that. I think there's been some unusual circumstances. Okay. Good idea. But yes, you can just fix. table that one, is what I recommend. And okay. Okay. Anyone else? That wasn't easy. I think that's one of the first times I've even had a uh, brass. <laughs> we can't down. vote in here. <laughs> you, you don't have many chances left. Yeah. You no, took it. I'm going to air all my grievances right now. Do you want to have a special idea? Bad idea. <laughs> you took care of it, Tammy. It Good job. Okay. Thank you. Item three. The legislative update from Kurt Fogo. <sighs> Kurt, you don't have to hurry. I don't have to hurry. Man, I made it kind of short, actually. Hey, Kurt, just to help you out, the yeah. main thing they want to know is how much money are we getting from the state this year? That's right. <laughs> we don't know yet. <laughs> we don't know yet. How much are other people? Actually, I'm, I'm vying for another group out there in the city to get a, a good chunk of money. That's your answer every year. Right? That's my answer every year. We, we can't use all that money. Uh, so, actually, everything is going pretty smooth at the Capitol. You know, last year was so much chaos. Uh, shortfall was was terrible. You know, we had several years of shortfall. <coughs> this is the first year in several um, that we actually have a little extra money. I think at the beginning of the session, I want to say it was around $600 million. I'm sure they're going to have another count here quickly uh, before they really get into the budget. Uh, but there are a couple top priorities uh, that uh, OML and other cities are facing on a couple bills I was going to talk about. And uh, the auxiliary containers bill, uh, this came up when we visited with our legislators. Uh, I refer to this as the trash bag bill. Uh, it has been flying through committee, Senate floor, um, House committee. It actually passed today, 6230. Um, probably the most votes I've seen against it, but uh, this is preemption in its truest meaning where the state is telling you that you can't put an ordinance on uh, trash bags or things like that. What has happened is uh, different groups out there like your uh, bottling companies, your, your uh, soda drinking associations and grocery store association I think is involved in it are pushing this legislation so that there's no cities that regulate their containers. It's not just trash bag, but we're talking about glass and boxes and things like that. So uh, they've really pushed it hard, and it's been very difficult for cities to make a case here. Um, the uh, different city lobbyists, actually, we, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago at the OML and talked about this and find it disappointing that it's the cities who, are, who own the, uh, the landfills and run the landfills. And there are some county operated landfills, but there are no state owned landfills. And here they are prescribing this kind of legislation on us. So we're having to battle that. Well, just, just a minute on that. It was yeah. a local control issue, but it sounds like what you're saying, it's also become an environmental issue to some people. Well, it's a, an overreach is what it, actually we talked about, um, I talked to Jody Lewis this week and they're wanting to change the narrative. It's it's not a trash bag issue anymore. It's, it's government overreach is what it is. It's the state telling us mm -hmm. who run the landfills on, you know, uh, what we can and can't do. And but because politics are involved. Politics, sure. Because I think probably everybody down there would be for local control. Sure. Because the state feels the same way when the federal government says, hey, you're going to do good That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So this is one of the disappointing battles 
uh, that we're facing. Uh, medical marijuana. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm getting on to the good stuff now. Uh, I just gave uh, Carol the latest legislation. This Senate Bill 1030 is the municipal fix for regulating dispensaries and the medical marijuana issue. Uh, there was a bill earlier in session called the Unity Bill, if you will, that kind of provided the legal bones of the industry on the state statutes, and they fast-tracked it through the process, which is rare and within a matter of weeks got it on the governor's desk. And now there's a series of other medical marijuana issues. This is our municipal bill, and then there's others that deal with the workforce and other categories, but uh, making their fix on the initial legislation. So um, seems to be moving through fairly easily. Um, it's out there. It's something we're going to have to deal with down the road. And, and like I said, I gave Carol the latest of that. So it's something we want to keep up with. We'll get to the other, other good one, uh, the golf course alcohol bill uh, I refer to. When you go golf today, um, you can't just buy a six pack of beer, put it in your cooler and go golfing the rest of the day like you used to. Uh, you had now today you have to buy a beer at the bar, open it at the bar and then walk out. And you can't have I guess the cheer cart was on hold and things like that. And so uh, this bill permits the sale of alcohol for off-premises consumption by golf courses. And there was an emergency clause on it, which means upon the governor's signature, it became law. And he, he just signed that last week. Uh, so that's something that uh, every municipal golf course is going to be interested in and solves a problem. Well, you, you mentioned that they haven't for, uh, allowed for a while for the consumption of beer on the... I, how long has that been in a... Well, uh, I, I haven't golfed a lot lately, but I... I think since October 1 of last year when the alcohol modernization legislation took effect in that state question, redid everything in the alcohol world. Wine started showing up at the grocery store and I think, but one of the, one of the problems was it messed up the golf course issue and it was just based on having a different permit, uh, permit that we had issues with on how to, how to get that permit because you're not supposed to have a permit as a municipality. So we figured out how to do that. Uh, military and wind energy. I thought this would be uh, nice to kind of showcase. Um, this is actually a project Mike Cooper worked on. I don't want to steal his thunder, uh, but it's significant. Um, that's why he's not here tonight. That's why he's not here That's tonight. right. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll just steal his thunder. We gave him the night off. <laughs> uh, this is House Bill 2118 by Representative Ortega. Ortega is from Altus. Uh, home of another significant military air, uh, air force base, uh, requires that new wind energy construction receive uh, determinations of no hazard and resolve any potential complaints or concerns on the part of nearby military facilities for beginning, beginning construction. That was the uh, description they used. Uh, this has been a, a two-year project, really, uh, that Ortega has really pushed for. Uh, Cooper really spent a lot of time on this. The wind industry... Um, came to the table it uh, because of the players it become became somewhat really non-political uh, so it was it was uh, resolved uh, the way it should be resolved um, this creates more communication before between the wind developer Oklahoma military strategic planning commission which Mike Cooper is part of uh, aeronautics commission and the corporation commission uh, new projects in Oklahoma will have to receive a military compatibility compliance letter from DOD Clearinghouse and have a DNA, uh, DNH from FAA before commencing construction. Uh, if you recall, uh, Mayor, I know you were there. It's about, I want to say, how long have you been a mayor? Eight, eight years? So eight years ago. Way less than eight years. Yeah. We, about eight years ago, we had a visit to the Pentagon the city of Enid took a contingency there, and I remember they talked about 45 minutes on wind energy. And that's what, that was kind of, we saw the birth of the clearinghouse then. And so it's been a pretty good relationship. I will also say that Inhofe has been in, on the scene of this issue, pushing for this. Um, this is by no doubt going to be model legislation that you're going to see in other states. So this is kind of a first for everyone. And uh, Oklahoma was the first to really dive in deep. And so this is going to be popping up in Kansas and every other state that has military base 
and win. So um, thank Cooper next time you see him because he put a lot of a lot of work on that. Kurt wasn't Fort Sill involved in that eight years ago also. I don't know. Um, it may have been more because of Shepherd's proximity to that area. <laughs> I'm, it's, I'm sure that it, it covered every military base, whether it was Air Force or not. Uh, water study, and we just happened to have a person on the board of the water resources here, and I just got through talking to him about this, brought this as, to his attention. On the surface, uh, this bill seems harmless. You want to look at, uh, you know, in-stream flow of uh, certain streams and rivers in the state and do some studies like, uh, like they have in the past. But this one basically comes up with a term called uh, treasured streams in the bill. And how they come up with treasured streams is identifying all the ri rivers and streams that happen to have endangered species associated with them. And uh, so if there's an endangered species out there, it involves certain streams. It involved an, a, a larger number of streams when they connected it to threatened species, which is a large, a, a lot more rivers and streams on the list. Um, but anytime you're studying in-stream flow, which is the relationship between groundwater, surface water, streams and how it interacts with one another, flowing out of one, going into the other. It, it maybe doesn't have a short-term consequence, but it will certainly have a long-term lasting consequence to it. And a lot of it is to limit how much water uh, you can potentially take out of the ground. I mean, that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal. And so um, I know the Water Board has had some concerns with how this was written. Um, OML in the beginning was taking a neutral approach to, to this bill and I've asked that they spend more time on this issue. Um, they, I think they had a meeting on it Monday. I learned today uh, that this bill actually had the title stricken, the maneuvers done to kind of slow it down and I learned today that this is going to turn into an interim study. Uh, so this, this is one to watch. Uh, this is going to be a costly study if they ever get there. Uh, just doing the math on what the water resources provided me and adding it up, it was going to be somewhere between 15 and $20 million study uh, over the 12 years. And then there would be lasting effects after that if they continue. So um, if you were to go back to instead of uh, the, tra what the, de the definition of treasured streams, uh, I said it was endangered species. If they were to use the li list of streams related to threatened species, that involves the Arkansas River. And, and uh, now we have a close connection to the Arkansas River with our Call Lake project. So, you know, it's, it's just we want to make sure that if we, they do head this direction or, or the different groups pushing this, um, you know, what the consequences down the road will be. Representative Humphreys from southeast Oklahoma, all these water issues and concerns always start there at Southeast Oklahoma. Uh, the author is from uh, from the Senate, on the Senate side is from Southeast Oklahoma. Did Representative Humphrey create this term, treasured stream? Um, like I think he, term. yeah, it, it's a brand new term, but it's code for, let's look at the rivers related to the endangered species. And so when you start talking about endangered species, you start talking about the federal government, EPA, Federal wildlife, you don't want those people involved. Uh, it, it could get complicated. Um, so anyway, our, our uh, local designee on the board uh, is aware of it. I think it came up in your meeting as well, you said, uh, talked about. But uh, one to watch. It's not going to go, like I said, it's not going to make it through the process. But there will be an interim study, and I'm going to encourage OML be involved in that interim study. Okay, um, last topic. So this is the aerial view of Norse. Uh, this is a topic that is back um, on the radar again. It was kind of on the radar a couple of years ago and then fell off, but uh, I think, is this the Greer Center or is it this? It's been right here? Right here. Okay, it's been a while since I've been back in there. Uh, so they're, they're operating out of this uh, area of the campus right now. 
Um, years ago, when Governor Fallon made the decision to go ahead and, and push uh, and, and shut down the, this area of the campus and, and push those uh, folks out into more group home atmosphere, which was probably not a bad decision. Um, we all got together with the Regional Development Alliance, uh, DHS, uh, OMS, OMES, and uh, City of Ian. And we just tried to, what can we do with this property? And one of the ideas that the Greer Center and DHS had was to locate the Greer Center to this corner of the campus right in here. And I recall, I wanted to say they were going to renovate this building or this or just kind of make a borderline right here and, and occupy that corner. And this is 30th Street right there and this is Willow. Um, so there is a proposal, a bond proposal on the desk at the, at the Capitol uh, for $12 million. And what DHS is asking for is an additional uh, funding request of just over a million dollars to start that bond process because that's what the payments would be. And uh, DHS has act actually just started actively, started talking to leadership about it. Um, they sent me some talking points and their talking points uh, basically match our discussions that we've had with relocating to that southeast part of the campus. I don't know what their plans would be with that 12 million, uh, whether it's to renovate or build a new I'm sure they, they reserve the right to change their mind, uh, but it would be the best that 12 million could get them and, and that's what they're estimating. Um, Greer Center or Liberty who runs Greer Center, they have a lobbyist at the Capitol. I've been working with him on communication. Uh, they've met with the governor's chief of staff, obviously encouraging this project. Um, I reached out to Gerald. I think we have a letter from our mayor supporting and Lisa at the Regional Development Authority. I notified her about uh, a, a this project coming to life again. And so Regional Development Alliance and the City of Enid have support letter to the governor and all the legislative leadership, including our local delegation uh, that would be involved in this decision making. Um, it's also important to know that I don't know that it's necessary that DHS get the money this year in their budget because by the time they let a bond, put it out for bid, close it, whatever the bond process, you know better than I do, you dealt with bonds as city council, uh, it takes about a, a year before that first payment comes around. So that would be the next budget cycle. Uh, but what I think DHS is looking for is some buy-in from the governor's office. DHS does not need the authority from the legislature to bond. They can just go out and do it on their own. What they do need is the extra money to pay for that bond. Uh, they can make the decision to bond, but they need the extra money. So they're looking for buy-in. They're looking for nods and a wink, if you will, from the legislature and the governor's office to say, let's go ahead and move on this project. And so that's kind of the process that we're working on right now. Uh, the reason for letters, we just need, we need com uh, community support to say that we want this. These are good paying jobs. Uh, this ensures that the facility stays here for several decades to come. And uh, the construction would obviously uh, could potentially be local. Uh, so a lot of, lot of benefits uh, come out of this. So this is probably project number one that I'm really focusing on to make sure it follows through. And, and uh, I believe I'm gonna pick up our city letter tonight and pass that out to the governor's office tomorrow and all the legislative leadership that have been uh, uh, copied on that letter, so. What's kind of the next step for doing the bigger thing, for finding some productive use of this section? Well, I would have to hand that over to Lisa. Uh, I know that in a couple of years ago, we had a plat put together of the property out here mm -hmm. um, in this area because when you look at the city map as a whole and you're doing planning, there seems to be a blank spot because the, the state of Oklahoma owns this entire one mile section, 640 acres. Um, and this 160 acres that happens to be over in this area, we, we could actually make that a kind of another industrial park area and try to allow the development authority to be the 
real estate brokers, if you will, uh, for the state of Oklahoma so that the state of Oklahoma is able to sell some of that property. I think what we're trying to avoid is uh, the state coming in and just selling it, putting it out on the auction block, selling the entire thing, and then what you end up with is a, a complex of buildings that are falling apart and eroding and an eyesore in 20 years. That's what we want to avoid. Well, but it sound, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Was it, but it sounds like, what, I mean, we're not actually avoiding that. With it, They put $12 million in Greer, Greer Center in this corner. The rest of it still, still, sits, there. still sits. Yeah, that, but that's step one, is to isolate them into this corner. There might be some buildings that could be repurposed in this area. I think there's some buildings in this area that could probably just be leveled. There's environmental concerns mm -hmm. with the entire property because of uh, the refinery at one time across the road. But does OMES have any plan for, I mean, is it? Their plan, I think, is to work with us. Okay. Now that we've reached out to them, their plan is to, okay, what city, of, what can you do, city of Enid, to help us maybe market some of the property, work together on what we're going to do, repurpose the rest of the buildings. We have an open lagoon right here. When you move this facility to here, they're going to hook over onto your water and our sewer. And that would be one step closer to maybe closing that someday. I don't know how many facilities are connected to that that are still operational. But it's just another, it's just another step. This is going to take a long time. But it's an important project. But yeah. the majority of the buildings that are on that uh, map right there are empty right now, right? I, I think so. I know that this White House, what I call it the White House, I think other people do, they, I think it's empty. I think of most of them are empty. Um, I, th I put a little closer picture in there of, of where they want to go. But I think they want to renovate this and possibly this and maybe, is that, Lisa, is that what you're thinking, heard? Yeah, and it would right. include new construction. <laughs> new construction. So renovation and addition. Do they, but, do you know if they intend to expand the number of people that are supported in Greer Center means an expansion? Or That's a great that? question that I hadn't thought of. Um, I'll ask. Okay. Does yeah. anybody know how much asbestos is in those wow. buildings? Mm -hmm. Probably a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, Whatever it is, you go, you're probably going to be able to double it. Well, that's that's one of the environmental concerns, you know, is not just the well sites or the the water well sites right. testing the water consistent or constantly, but the asbestos that might be associated with some of those buildings. So, um, it would be it's a hard piece of property to sell. I mean, if the state of Oklahoma wanted to come in and sell everything except the lagoon and this campus they it go real quick but you know we're going to have to work with the the city i mean the city the state dhs we're all going to have to work together to keep this from being an eyesore well, aren't yeah. there three wells on the uh section i don't know how i know you can see i don't know that's a old well, well too, there Maybe three. I know they have testing wells around there. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, another thing that may happen, I, I think there's been talked about somebody from the governor's office, or, or we're going to start having some guests come out from the state and looking at it. So every time we have a guest, we just need to make sure we have somebody from the city and somebody from the Development Alliance. And, yeah. Brent Kissling will know all about it. Yes, we're keeping Brent informed, a good friend at Commerce. <laughs> since he has uh, a history with uh, of trying to make this work. So anyway, it's a big project. And it's, it's not going to be overnight either, it's, uh, but it's a, a, another step. And then once that's done, we'll work on another step. But we've got to keep moving on. All right, I, I sent out a, a list of bills to Gerald today, if you want to send those around. And... I think I already have. Okay, all right. So uh, if you have any questions, give, give me a call. Thank you, Kurt. All right, thank you, guys. Have a safe trip tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Item four, Enid Soccer Complex update from Jessica Nelson. Jessica? Hi. 
Long time no see. How's it going? Well, I'm really excited about this project and this is kind of what I've got lined up to talk about tonight. I'll try to keep it short and sweet and give you plenty of time to ask questions. You have all the time you need. Well, I was told I had 10 minutes, Mayor. That's really hard for me to fit into. You can stretch that into 40 minutes. Oh, I don't think we'll need that, but I appreciate that. Um, I remember how to work this. Just to remind you, Enid Sports is a nonprofit organization. Um, it very much is built in the same management style like the David Allen Memorial Ballpark downtown as a public private partnership. Um, we're working very closely with the city on construction and eventual operation of the soccer complex. Um, it's really the mission is to grow sports and create a positive economic impact for the community and to just involve the community, not only Enid, but surrounding areas and, and get them here to shop, to dine, to see what we're about and maybe hopefully move here. Um, and ultimately it's to serve our children that are in here. Um, my first very exciting update is for Longfellow Middle School. Um, Enid Sports has partnered with Enid Public Schools in a very successful private-public partnership on uh, the construction of an expanded playground at the school. Um, Enid Public Schools is funding playground improvements through the recent bond issue that happened in 2016, and Enid Sports is coming in with a soccer field um, that will have irrigation and really, really nice grass that Johnston Seed is providing. Um, and it'll just be a really good improvement for the east side of town. It should be done by the time school starts in August and that will correlate positively with the middle school athletic program coming back to the schools. Um, before we move on to the complex, does anyone have any questions? How large the soccer field is that going to be? That is 110 yards long by 100 yards wide. So it's a little bit bigger than a football field, just to give you reference. It'll look really nice. So It'll look awesome. really nice. Have you acquired all the housing on the west of the soccer field? Yes, over the last 10 months, EPS bought homes um, and helped the tenants find new housing. And then, of course, we've, we've demoed them. So uh -huh. We went through the rezoning process and we were approved last night at the MAPC meeting um, to be rezoned as special use. So all that's going very well. Um, the bid opening for the playground is on May 8th and the soccer field's being privately funded through Enid Sports. So there's no bidding for that, but it's, it's gonna be right after the playground's built. It'll, it'll be a positive impact for that. I'm excited. I'm excited about this one. I assume you're going to have a really high fence on both ends there to keep the balls from going into Broadway or Randolph. Yes, sir. We sure will. It's uh, spec'd out to be 16 foot high and I, I think 20 foot wide. I'll have to double check the width um, in the specs. But yes, to prevent when kids kick for a goal to prevent the ball from going out into the street. We, safety was a major concern. and. Um, and not so much anymore. That I think the fence will solve the problem. But anything else? So that's happening fast. That's happening fast. Yeah. Like in the next 30 days type Correct. fast. That's my kind of fast. Yeah. I like that. I'm very excited about this. a bunch of dirt moved out there. Big piles of dirt along one side. Uh, thanks to a water line project just a few blocks away, um, the same contractor, Cimarron Construction, uh -huh. is replacing a water line. And, yeah. Uh, there they happened extra dirt and just dumped it there. They're bringing me some dirt, Fantastic. so it's it's really nice. Forty loads of dirt. It's a lot of dirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of dirt. Yeah, they're going to have a watering system, I assume, on this part to be a part of this field. Yes, sir. That's correct. We've already got two wells dug out at the site and connected. Um, and once the irrigation system goes in, we'll we'll tie in that connection. And um, it's, it everything's field, going it, very positively. Is the field going to be turf or? Grass. It will be grass, but not your standard front lawn. It's a very, um, it's called Monaco. It's a high bred grass, not a grass person. I wish I could use better <laughs> analogies. Grass it, it, yeah, grass people, man, that's a mad science for them, but um, it's very nice. It'll be the nicest grass in the district. Um, in fact, 
it may be the nicest grass in the city at some point, but um, it's very good for soccer and other sports because the blades are, they, they're kind of wide and they grow short, um, kind of kind of like a golf green, you know, that type of blade. I could get Joey Mybergen in here and he could tell you all about it, but <laughs> but that's about all I get, can provide you. So, is there any other questions on Longfellow? basketball courts next to the school they sure are They're, they sure are and that one that's in the center um, that's what I like to call a flex court um, we're striping it to be a volleyball a pickleball and maybe even tennis just to give some flexibility to the kids out there that want to use it and then those three dots that are kind of in the middle those represent tetherball poles and then there's some swings out there that we're relocating. That's that yellow line on the bottom sheet. Um, that So the kids will have swings. Um, it's exciting. The kids are really excited. All school year, they've kind of not had the best view. Um, we removed 9th Street. I'm sure you remember 9th Street going through there. And so we like to call that Lake Longfellow <laughs> when it rains. Um, but coming next year, when they get back to school, they'll be very excited and I think very pleased with the improvements um, and the neighborhood all together. I, I think it'll be a really good improvement for this side of town and just these streets in, in general. So. It is not a competitive soccer field. It, it won't be, um, well, that's not enough, true. Don't have enough parking for a There's not enough parking. Um, the main purpose is to provide practice for the middle school team. Um, they could do games. It won't have stadium lighting um, for after hour games. And, um, and that was discussed with school officials. Do we need lighting? Do we not need lighting? And it was determined that if we had lighting, then um, kids in the neighborhood would be out there until midnight. <laughs> so if you, if, you know, there'll be safety lighting, of course, kind of like parking lot lighting. Um, but, you know, we also want kids to go home and go to bed so they can do good on their state testing tomorrow. So, <laughs> you know, but it'll be a good practice facility and it'll provide the neighborhood a good place to go for the young club teams to practice. Um, overall, it's a huge improvement. True. I think so. So... Um, just to remind you why we're here again, since I haven't talked to you, I looked it up October 2017. That's a long time. I've been working really hard on this project. I'm excited to be here. Um, we have over a thousand kids in Enid alone that play soccer between club soccer, middle school soccer, and high school soccer. In fact, fun fact, um, the high school soccer team draws more kids than any other sport at the high school. The only exception is band they get more kids and band. Um, so that's exciting. And now that Coach Liddell is back with Enid High, the program's just exponentially growing and he's really getting it together. And our, our team is doing really well this year. Um, they're looking forward to the new complex and to being out there. We are, Enid Public Schools and Enid Sports um, are discussing options to get the high school team out at, at the new complex on what I like to refer to as the championship field, which you can see way back there. Um, and uh, it would be very similar to David Allen. I'll keep referring to David Allen as an example because it truly is a wonderful example of a private-public partnership with the schools, the city, and the David Allen Memorial Ballpark Board. Um, we want to mimic that, and I think we have a good example to follow. So. Um, you know, these are some of the organizations in town that are very excited about this. As I mentioned, the high school, of course, but we've also got Enid Soccer Club. Um, they're getting excited to have a more adequate soccer facility. As you know, they've been for the last two decades in the city's retention pond. Um, it started in 1992, I believe, with a handful of kids that just wanted a place to play and the city so graciously allowed them to play there but they're to a point now where they can't accommodate growth. It's difficult to host tournaments because there's not enough parking and um, restroom facilities. And 
have any of y'all ever tried to find that place? <laughs> it's not easy to find unless you play soccer. So um, this new location will provide easier wayfinding for out of town teams and um, bigger capacity for tournaments that the club can host and um, just a more adequate soccer facility as soccer's growing nationwide. And so we're, we're hopping on this train with the rest of the United States. And so it's something that we should be very proud of. And um, we're excited. The YMCA is excited. They have never had an outdoor soccer program. They've only had indoor. So um, we're working very closely with Mr. Schamberg at the Y on creating possibilities to get the Y out there, not only for soccer, but maybe an adult league or um, 5Ks. We're gonna have plenty of sidewalks out there. We're working closely with them. And perhaps what I'm most excited about is um, the possibility to host the National Junior College AA, I always forget, <laughs> NC, NJCAA, whew. Yeah, that's that's rough. Um, you know, very much like we host for baseball, the World Series at David Allen, we have the opportunity to host the national championships in soccer in the fall every year. Um, it's very exciting. Jeremy Heise is the new athletic director at NOC, and we've already been in contact. They are looking to introduce soccer at the Enid campus starting as soon as August of 2020, which is not very far away. And that's exciting. They only have uh, soccer at their Tonkawa campus now. So to create that opportunity here in Enid and provide more opportunities for scholarships, even to keep our Enid kids home to go to college here, um, it's just overall a good, it's a, it's a win, win, win. It's a good deal. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And then of course we've got the Oklahoma City Energy that, um, is interested in hosting a preseason game at this facility and um, that's the professional team just out of Oklahoma City and um, they're offering some some contributions to the complex um, in, in lieu of equipment um, which is exciting too. So. If you were to land the junior college national championship could you play it at Garland and Roop or would you have to go to the high school stadium? You, you could play it at Garland and Roop. Right now, up until year 2022, 20, they host four teams in the championships. What they're looking to do is expand it to a three-day tournament with the top 12 junior colleges, which is awesome for us. And that, that bid period is actually going on now. August 1 is when the bids are due. And we're working with Enid Public Schools to go ahead and submit a bid, knowing that this first game would be at Selby Stadium here at EP, with EPS. And then if the complex is done by the, by the next fall, they could transition out to the new complex. Regardless, Enid Sports will bid on it the following term, which will then move to a four-year term. Right now it's a two-year term. How many seats are you going to have? In the stadium? Uh, we're, we're looking to seat about 1,200 right now. Um, I, I, there's plenty of room out there, so I think that could grow, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, uh, it's a little early to determine that, but we're, we're shooting for 1,200. Your drawing shows six fields besides the main field. Um, yeah, this is a good reference for you. We have six fields, three on the north side, three on the south side, and then the main field in the center there on the west end. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And it's important to know this, and I, I didn't include this because it's, it's not as pretty as a picture, but I can try to make one pretty next time. Um, each of these full-size fields can be divided into smaller fields um, for youth. Yeah, you, very much like, um, well, like baseball. In t-ball, they're on a little field, you know, and then they move up to a bigger field until they get old enough. Soccer's very much the same way. They start on a... 30 by 40 yard field and then they move up until they get to about age 13 and then they're on a full size field all the way through through college. Um, so that being said, whenever we host a youth tournament, when the soccer club puts on a competitive tournament or a recreational tournament, they those fields can be divided in so many different ways. There's gonna be thousands 
thousands of people out here. I mean, right now we, our soccer complex filters at least 2,500 people just on a regular soccer weekend. Imagine that in a facility twice the size and a large scale tournament. That's thousands. I mean, I, I don't even know how to put a number to it. <laughs> Would you explain club soccer? <laughs> well, yeah. Mayor Shuey, <laughs> club soccer. Yes, I can explain club soccer. Um, it all starts whenever your kid starts kicking a ball around at age two and breaks something. That's how it begins. And then you say, Lucas, we need to make you run while you do that. And so you, you take them to your yard, <laughs> and then you learn that they're actually good at running and kicking at the same time. And there's so many kids that do that. So then parents start saying, well, where do we, where do we go for this? And truthfully, they usually start at the Y, because that's what most parents, I think, think of whenever they're getting started. And um, while the, the Y is fantastic, but as I mentioned before, they start with an indoor league, and they, there comes a point in time when your kid starts kicking the ball and it bounces back at you because it hit the wall and that's not how real soccer is played <laughs> the ball just doesn't appear you know so then you move on to outdoor soccer and thankfully enid soccer club has been a very strong organization in the community for years and uh, has a very good reputation as being able to stay consistent and so you know most most people gravitate, you can Google Enid Soccer and you go to enidsoccer.com and that leads you to the club. Now the way club soccer is built up is there's youth leagues, which is called recreational soccer. And that's from age four until age 12. And then, well, it's actually truly up until age 18, but usually around age 12, kids that really like soccer can try out to be a part of the competitive league. And that's, where they go and represent Enid outside of Enid. We have home games here at our turn, at our complex here, at our future complex too. And then we send kids, right now we have seven competitive teams, is that right? I believe that's right, seven competitive teams. That's seven teams, rosters the size of 16 to 20 of kids that go out to Oklahoma City, Lawton, Wichita, Broken Arrow and represent <coughs> our town via Enid Soccer Club. It, it's hard to, I mean, you, when you think about that, you think about youth sports all the time, but that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of kids that do it consistently. Um, does that help answer your question? Because I'm not really sure if that does. I, I assume those towns that you're talking about that we go to would come to Enid or would like to. That's correct, and they do now. That's, a, that's when it becomes a win-win situation to me. That's correct, Mayor, and they, they come now. They do come now. They get lost sometimes. <laughs> they show up a little late to game sometimes because the coach has to call the club and say, we can't find you, you know, and, and they show up, and generally where they come from, they have a better-looking facility, a more adequate soccer-playing facility. So at times, you know, it, it can be a little embarrassing for our community. And this facility will definitely put Enid on the map and with pride that we can all be proud of, especially our soccer players. They're excited. They're really excited. It will, is be, easy, it will be easy to tell them to find Walmart and go south. Sure it will. Oh, yeah. Sure it will. It is the plan that all soccer now, all Enid soccer is going to be moved to this location? Um, we're in positive conversations with the Enid Soccer Club Board. Right now, the idea is that the current complex can continue to be mowed by the city of Enid's park department because it, it will need to anyway and allow the kids to practice out there. And then games, this would be a game only facility. Um, or camps, you know, special events for, for the soccer. Are the, um, those fields going to be lighted? Th um, the championship field will be lit n now. I, I say now because it really de depends on the budget. Much like the city, we, we have a, on the private side, we have a budget that we need to stick to as well. I can tell you um, on this slide, this slide shows you our current partners in the community that are excited to help out on the complex, one of them being Byram Electric. Um, 
Byram is donating the material and labor to run conduit anywhere and everywhere in the complex for future lighting, whether it's stadium lighting, you know, park lighting, safety lighting. Um, that that is Steve Byram's generous donation to to make this happen. Um, everyone on this on this page is excited and is offering either gifts and monetary factor or services. Um, in kind donations and I I would assume that more come as we get further along um, but yes to answer your question eventually the hope is to have all lit fields it really becomes a budget thing um, as always you know that <laughs> but the championship field will be lit because that is a requirement for the high school and for the NJCAA so um, let me get you to, you all know where the location is. I just wanted to have that for reference for you, but, um, I think I'm actually kind of jealous of the pilots that get to fly over this and get to see it because I, I, I really want to get an aerial whenever it's, it's completed. I think it'll look really nice. And the mayor pointed out earlier, where do I get all that green grass? <laughs> so that's nice. But. I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. On, uh, Garland Road. Mm -hmm. I assume, though, my assumption is that a lot of the games will be on Sundays, Saturdays, and Sundays on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, there's a church across the street, World Harvest. Yeah, that's church. not on Google yet. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, my concern is, will this road be widened? Let me address that for you, sir. Yep. Okay. I'm the I was going to say, this is Chris's ballpark. Um, I'm not going to say it. No, this is not my ballpark. This oh, is my this transportation is you. This issue. This isn't me. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't me. Um, you know, the city has, has agreed to partner with the folks over here at the Inner com Complex to, to contribute to this. And one of those things is to help with the transportation. Uh, and we'll start that process in the new budget year. You'll see it in the budget. And if you approve it, we will get started. Uh, the intent is to improve Garland such that we can safely, with XLD cell lanes, I can show that. Success, success, bleh, safely get the public off and on Garland during these events and during the changeover. Because the traffic that we're going to be seeing is going to be rather large. Um, and as you'll recall, World Harvest has XLD cell lanes on their side of the road because it's a requirement of site plan. So this will help us give us sufficient um, road surface, travel surface, to stripe those to put in left turn lanes where necessary, you know, and we'll have the acceleration, deacceleration lanes. Um, we've, we've specifically addressed the fact that on the exits, we want a left turn lane for the outbound traffic as well. So we can get the traffic safely moving. The roof at that location too is a dirt road. Correct. We won't be dealing with roof first. It's not my priority. My priority is get people safely off of and onto Garland during game day and changeover. And we've lined the we've lined the uh, the entrances up with the roads across the street. Chris, one of the, one of the uh, views that we saw a while ago had three entrances off of Garland, and that only shows two. Yes, may I have the pointer if you would please? Oh sure. Uh, this this one is this layout is not the most current one. This one is relatively close to the most current one. one you know, and we will focus, and this one will be uh, just opposite of World Harvest. Okay, so as an entrance? As an entrance. Okay. Um, so in the middle is going to be an exit or both in the, the middle one? This one? Oh, yes, th no, these will both, these, all, both of these are my number one priority okay. based on the way the, my understanding of the way the field's laid out. Okay. And if it changes, you'll have to let me know. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but they'll have both in and out traffic. But since I'm putting XL diesel lanes here, here, and eventually here, and I've already got them on this side here, I'll have plenty of pavement to stripe it, to make traffic work the best it can based on what we've got and what we plan on building. And one other question. Um, I mean, if that area really develops with retail or anything, mm -hmm. I'm talking about in the future, we have a plan set in place to where we need some traffic lights or some type of, you know, like we did on, um, what is that? Cleveland? On Oakwood, on Oakwood in front of the uh, 
uh, the, the, nursing home the Oakwood Crossing. Right. Um, Do you have any type of crossing that kind of slow down traffic or reduce the speed of traffic? Uh, we can always reduce the speed of traffic relatively easy. It's only 45 at this time. Uh, and when you add that kind of traffic on there, the, the traffic will naturally slow down some. And getting the traffic off the travel lane and into the turning lanes will help. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you've been to very many of these events, but the traffic is strongly one direction in and one direction out, and they stagger almost on top of each other, but a lot of it is staggered. So, uh, and, and as we get more attention to this and more outside clients and people attending ball field, ball, uh, sports field, people from other outside the town, uh, teams and such, as it develops, then we'll look at the traffic, we'll do traffic impact analysis to determine what's required to safely control this. The reason why I ask that question, Chris, because even at the Enid High School games, you know, a lot of our police officers have to go out and kind of mm -hmm. regulate the traffic and slow it down. Correct. So I'm just... Yeah, it's for a very short period of time. It's, it's traffic intense, um, but we have a pretty good idea on how to do that. And as we add commercial to this, uh, part of the requirement for development is going to be traffic impact analysis. Part of it will eventually to improve this intersection down here, so it works better. You probably, we probably won't need to put a traffic control light there for quite some time. Not until you pave Rube. <laughs> <laughs> That's not on my list. <laughs> well, it's certainly better situated here than the high school. I mean, there's just yes. more room to run out. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Chris, yes, sir. Where's the other 35 acres? Is it on the north or the west? It's over here. This is our stormwater detention facility right here. Correct. And so, so the 35 is all to the west. I believe the majority of it's over here. Is, there, is that. there is a little patch right here um, that I don't know exactly what the development plans are for. I haven't seen any. Um, I would expect that would be a little bit later down the road. Is there any concern, Jessica? For that you don't own the rest of it, rest of the quarter? Uh, well, um, it is owned. It's not owned by Enid Sports. It's owned by an LLC um, that is working closely with our donors. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no concern. Um, in fact, it's a very positive relationship because we we get almost first priority. You know, if, if um, something undesirable wanted to come and, and be built right there in front that didn't make sense to the facility itself we have the first right to say no enid sports does um, does your burn uh, assume only the 125 acres that you're getting ready to do on the burn plan does it concern the 125 acres the entire burn, burn plan no um it's concerning just the frontage and all the way to the back where the complex ends we're not burning the entire quarter mile section you need to dry up. Yeah. Well, and the wind is, weather's interesting right now. <laughs> it is Oklahoma. Yes, it is. Is there any plan to extend the walking path that, that, that stops right there at, at Garland? The walking trail? Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a, a strategic trail master plan that does have it crossing there. Um, when that does happen, once again, we'll evaluate the traffic and decide what we need to do. Isn't it intended to go north? Uh, north and west is my understanding. As far as money allows. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind, Commission, is development takes time. And so uh, this development will be an ongoing development over the course of probably the next decade. I think you're going to tell us about the schedule that you have to get it open and running. Um, so that road over time likely at some point will be expanded but uh, uh, there's certainly a resource we're resource constrained in fact we're working toward we're working actually north of Garriott now on Garland on intersection design and potential widening of the future but um, this will be an exciting development for many years to come and as Jessica pointed out it's a public private thing so as we invest in some infrastructure and the soccer sports association invests in the 
facilities there, there will be more people investing over time. And you've listed a bunch of the sponsors, but I think there'll be even more. I agree with you. I think more will so, get involved. I think so. Um, since you brought up schedule, um, you guys have the most exciting thing going on right now. Yay! <laughs> You're bidding the, uh, the city's bidding water and sewer next week which is the very first stage of getting closer to construction. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the uh, Chris kind of knows the timeline for the city things, whereas I know more about um, the private side of it, but we've been working good together, right? Oh, absolutely. These bids are due in next week on the 23rd. Um, we'll open them like we do all our others. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll get with Jessica and her engineer on this, this soccer park and figure out when they're going to do their mass grading and then we'll integrate those activities such that we don't disturb that they get their rough grading in we can get our sewer line in maybe our water line and just make it all work out a lot better mm -hmm. and that you know that that's the beginning of this soccer park when, when are you projecting you'll have fields to play on there uh, our target date is spring 2021 now, that may be a little aggressive on the city side of things, but on the private side, it's it's not so much. There will be a point in time during construction that our, the private contractor and the city's contractors will be out there simultaneously. Um, it's, it's going to be a phasing, but I don't see any reason to hold back playing on the new fields just to, for the entire project to be complete. I don't think that... I don't know. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't feel like that's necessary. I think we getting the kids out of the detention pond is a is a huge concern for me, and um, and just giving them something to be excited about. So. And this is and this is kind of why we've set the priority on the transportation part for this soccer park, is to facilitate their desire to get on it as soon as they got. They have fields that are ready to play. Okay. Um, this isn't entirely what I think we'll, you'll end up seeing in the end. Uh, the intent is to have a public road up in this area that will, and then an entrance into the parking lot. So those are some of the latest plans that have been developed for the, the soccer park and to, to kind of facilitate not just getting them off and on, but building parking spots and progressing west. Do you project that this road will go on to Wheat Ridge or what? Maybe in that's, 50 years. That's oh, hard to say. <laughs> You're going to have to cross another Just, just the dollar signs that are adding up to roads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty confident we'll not be in the budget. Jessica, I have a dumb question. How many restrooms are there and where are they? That's a lot of kids. Um, that's not a dumb question. That's um, every mom. I don't see many on that diagram. Well... That's because you're not seeing toilets right now, but that, that's every mommy's first question is where is the bathroom whenever they exactly. get there. Um, this white building, I'm not very good at, there we go. This white building right here is um, what I've deemed the clubhouse. Um, that just naturally came, um, it's a very common term in soccer, you know, where do you register at the clubhouse? Where's the ref locker room at the clubhouse? So um, while that looks small on this screen, the projected design is about 4,000 square feet, and that's to include public restrooms, and that's a code thing. Um, you know, I, I am not, my brain doesn't work that way, but I yeah, guarantee that, you that there's going to be more than right two. A disaster. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. There's only four toilets out there right now. Um, it, it will definitely have more than that um, it, it, to accommodate larger crowds. I don't exactly know how they determine that. I think it has something to do with parking spaces in a park analogy. I'm not sure how that, that works, but um, that, that facility will also house the locker rooms that the high school and NOC can use and any other user that comes in. Um, it should have a, what I, I call a flex office that can be used by the soccer club or Enid high school coaches or um, any other user that needs a place to host a meeting to discuss upcoming tournaments or camps or referee training, anything, you know, a, a multi-purpose office. Um, and that that's kind of the gist of that facility, but that's where 
that's where the restrooms will be located. And we thought very long and hard about this. And I spent 18 months going to different complexes around the country and picking things that made sense and picking things that didn't make sense and trying to combine all of the benefits into this facility um, wasn't easy, but you know, one of, one of the biggest things that I can tell you right now is centrally located bathrooms is important. Um, where it's located <laughs> can be easily accessed from any of the fields. Um, and also another thing of importance was a playground, a centrally, centrally located park with a playground for the kids who aren't playing soccer. Um, my son's soccer games are an hour and a half. My seven-year-old cannot sit that long. <laughs> so being able to watch my son play here and my daughter just, you know, several more yards away on the playground is every mommy's dream. Um, so, you know, that's another benefit. The parking, being able to pull up to your field and get out and walk a short distance to where you're playing is an absolute benefit to every soccer parent because it's not just them walking there they have strollers they have wagons they have coolers they have equipment um and having the ability you know if one game's here and then two hours later you've got a game over here where you can just drive on down and park right in front of that field that's really nice and that's not very common in you a sure lot of soccer do that where they are now you okay. sure cannot do that where they are now and there's a lot of complexes where you can't do that um you know a, a lot of complexes in the state are not funded with a partnership with the city so they have to do things at the most cost effective way with their monies and it is more cost effective to build a sea of parking but when it comes to attracting people back to your complex, this is going to be something that when people go back home and they sit there and brag about how Enid, all they had to do was get out and walk straight to their field, that's, that's going to be something we're going to be proud of, and we're going to be proud of this investment. I have one more question. Yes, sir. Have you looked into having a, an Air Force nationwide tournament there? It's, I have it's not. It's two miles from Vance Air Force Base. It is. And it's got all the practice fields, and people in the United States know where Vance Air Force Base is. They sure do. I think but, it's but a possibility. It, it'll I, take some time. It, but, yes, uh, it does. They would like to be in Enid in August. Okay. Well, you know, I, I have a hard time saying no to anything, so I'm all for looking into that in the They air. have competition all over the United States. Okay. I know where they're having it right now and pick the green. I sure will. I'll get back to you on that. Are there going to be bleachers on all of these fields or? Uh, you'll see this is bleachers on the championship field. That's that's where we were talking about the 1200. The stand around the side. Well, actually in the sport of soccer, it is very common to bring your own chair. Uh, it, it's not abnormal. Every soccer family knows that. That's and the, walking sucks and <laughs> the, Yes, because you're hauling so much. But the reason that is, just to give you an explanation, is as I mentioned before, each field can be subdivided. Um, you don't want bleachers moving around, dragging across your, your nice game field and creating ruts when the next game you may turn it around into another field. So portable seating that they bring themselves it's it's just the way of life in soccer it's it's the and, way and it there's is. only going to be the one building on the complex that's all you've got planned now that's all that's in the plans now okay. yes but it is a four thousand square foot building so it's rather large it's not a very big building as buildings go well soccer's played outside so <laughs> that's helpful <laughs> that's helpful but you know, I, you know, I, I would, only thing I'm judging you is I had a, I, I managed an office of five thousand square feet. Oh they yeah. Didn't seem all that big. Bingo. Bingo. No, um, thankfully they're not all going to be in there all the time. Uh, the locker rooms are fairly large, and we're working on um, making them kind of have film room capabilities, so they'll be a little larger than a normal locker room. Um, there's really no need for a large building. Are they going to have concessions out there? That's what I was going to ask. Uh, Yes. Concessions. 
ask if they were going to have concessions out there? Yes and no. <coughs> and the reason I say that is um, Enid Sports, we're, the board is very adamant. We don't want to be in the food industry. We don't want to compete with Rib Crib and Subway right down the street, you know, and Swadley's. And in the in soccer, you know, you really just need to get your kid fed for about an hour before you go to lunch. <laughs> so there will be a snack bar. You know, I have no interest in, in frying food um, or, you know, every once in a while we may have a cookout or a large enough tournament to where we can have food trucks. Mm -hmm. um, this, sorry, wrong button. This road right here, I call it a road. It's really a glorified driveway. Um, it's about 20 foot wide. So um, to put that into scale, these are 10 foot wide, which is about the width of a trail on the trail system. So for future connectivity, that could be ideal. But that 20 foot wide road is ideal for deliveries to the clubhouse building and for food trucks on large scale tournaments, which I think from an operational standpoint would be more, would, is more preferable than to having our own concession stand to maintain and, and staff. And as I said before, I don't want to be in the food business. I, I want that money to go back into the city. And that's just, I, I'm okay with cheese sticks and crackers. <laughs> I can handle that, but we don't need a full blown concession stand. Jessica, one more question. Sure. Uh, is there going to be any fencing anywhere? Like on the outer perimeter? Yes. Uh, we didn't put that in the renderings because it's ugly. It makes it ugly. And I don't like that. So, yeah, there, there will be, um, well, actually, I think this plan shows a little better. You can see right here a gate and right here a gate so we can close off whenever we're not operating the parking so no one's going back in there and, um, you know, causing havoc. But also there will be safety fencing along this west side because we know that there's acreage out there and we, we don't want any undesirables going that way. So um, there will be safety fencing between the parking for the kids that are playing. We don't want them chasing after a ball and getting run over. Um, there's fencing, it's just not, well, it's, uh, it's these little X's right here. That's how you can tell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 16 foot, just like that. Like Those will not be 16 foot. That'll be a standard, uh, Five yes, okay. fence. Um, <clears throat> there, on, there will be netting systems which is also pretty typical in soccer complexes to put a, a net system behind a goal that you can lower and, and raise the net. Um, that's pretty typical. I can show you that next time. It's hard to anticipate yeah, I, your I, questions. I've seen them over in Tulsa. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, off of, uh, 169. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, Titan. Yeah. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's a great facility. That's awesome. So this is the this is my favorite rendering because it really gives you a perspective of how how we're tur turning a wheat field into something that the city can really gain from. Um, is that Enid sign for real? <laughs> is that Enid sign for real? That's pretty, well, that's pretty neat. It is pretty neat. I I hope we can raise enough funds to make that real. I think that's pretty neat too. Um, really, ultimately, it, it's all about fundraising from here on out. The capital campaign is kicking off soon, and. Um, and that's really just to get the extras for the clubhouse and possibly make the championship field artificial turf. Right now it's scheduled to be turf or uh, natural turf. So um, there's a capital campaign that will be launched. So if you're interested in helping out with this project, this is my due diligence to, make that to show you. Sign you with a lot of concrete around it so they'll take pictures from there. Okay. I'll, I'll expect your check in the mail, Mayor Shuey. Right? <laughs> we have a logo right now. <laughs> Are you going to have a special right place for, like, bus parking? Uh, that's a good question, and that's something we've talked about. It's it, We don't show it here, but actually we've talked about it with the engineering staff. Um, I think currently what is possible is you could do overflow parking in the grass area or this grass area, but it is being talked about. I don't have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Anything else? I know I'm running out of time. I guess I did go over 10 minutes. <laughs> That's a good program. We've loaded a lot into 2020 and 2021. 
It's going to continue to be great days and great years. <laughs> I'm excited, and thank you so much for your involvement. I think it's partnerships like this that benefit the community and it's not just soccer and it's not just baseball but it sets a good example for how other things can happen in the future and it, it's important i'm glad we're able to work together and get this done That's good. all right i'm done thank you thanks, thanks for having me i'm excited thank for you. our next update <laughs> keep, up, keep up the good work Item five, we are adjourned. We'll meet upstairs at 630. Thank you for watching the Enid City Commission study session. All meetings are broadcast on local cable channel 12 and in high definition on channel 112. In addition, the study session is live streamed on the web at enidtv.org. If you have any questions or comments regarding this broadcast, please visit the City of Enid website at enid.org.